In 2008, NASA had an intriguing question. How do spiders construct their webs in zero gravity? Therefore, they sent two spiders to the International Space Station. The first spider was the main participant, while the second served as a backup in case the first one didn't survive. However, things didn't go according to plan. The backup spider managed to escape from its chamber and visited its companion, resulting in a bit of a mess. They built tangled webs that interfered with each other. As if that wasn't enough, the flies that were supposed to be food for the spiders started reproducing faster than anticipated. Their larvae escaped from their container and covered the front window of the chamber. Over time, the spiders were completely hidden behind the larvae. Although this initial experiment didn't go well, one of the researchers involved in planning the spider experiment was still curious. In 2011, she got another opportunity to repeat the same experiment. This time, she sought assistance from other researchers. They decided to send a different species of spider into space and prepared four spiders, two for the ISS and two for Earth, allowing for result comparison. The goal was to expose the spiders to varying gravity conditions and observe their behavior. However, another twist appeared in the story. Initially, they believed they had four female spiders, but it turned out that two of them were actually males. Determining the sex of young spiders can be tricky, but fortunately, one male had already been sent to space while the other remained on Earth, enabling valuable data collection. The second experiment proved successful. The spiders were active. They built and dismantled webs, and even without the assistance of gravity, they spun new ones. Three cameras captured thousands of pictures, showcasing their hard work on the webs. Interestingly, it seemed that spiders created significantly more symmetrical webs in space than on Earth. The center of the webs was closer to the middle, and surprisingly, the spiders didn't always position their heads downward as they typically do on Earth. However, one significant factor made all the difference. Light. When the spiders on the ISS had a source of light, they weaved asymmetrical webs, similar to those found on our home planet. Light played a crucial role in orienting the spiders in space. The chamber's lamps were attached at the top. If the lights had been positioned differently, for example on the side, it would have been challenging to observe the effect of light on the symmetry of webs in zero gravity. When the lights were turned off, the spiders rested in random orientations within their webs. Yet with the lights on, they would orient themselves away from the light source, which meant downward. Hence, in the absence of gravity, light assisted them in orientation. This discovery was unexpected, because spiders can typically build their webs in the dark and capture prey effectively, even without light. Spider's web itself is such a cool thing wherever they are. It's like these creatures have small silk production factories inside them. Within their body, a thread is stored in the form of a highly concentrated liquid. And a regular garden spider can produce up to seven different types of silk, each having a unique combination of proteins. Each type of silk has a different purpose. For example, one type of thread makes the web elastic, which means the web absorbs the impact when insects collide with it. Another type of silk makes the thread flexible and strong, so it's more difficult to break. Some proteins found in the silk protect it from harmful bacteria and fungi, allowing the web to last longer. They also keep the silk moist so it doesn't dry out. Wow, imagine having a home where you don't have to buy anything extra to maintain it. Spider silk is lighter than cotton and incredibly thin, up to a thousand times thinner than human hair. But it's also insanely strong. I mean, it must be since that's what they rely on while living their everyday life. Whether they're preying on some wandering insect or trying to resist heavy rain and wind. But you wouldn't expect it to be stronger than steel, right? Of course, in reality, you don't come across steel that thin. But if you could find a piece with the same weight as spider silk, you'd see that it has similar strength when pulled or stretched. In fact, spider silk is five times stronger than steel of the same thickness. Spider silk is also super stretchy, able to stretch up to four times its original length without breaking. Plus, it remains strong even in freezing temperatures below minus 40 degrees F. The most common type of spider is the orb weaver. They're masters at building those webs you keep seeing in open areas. That's where they have a better chance to catch a tasty lunch. 
But since they choose such spots, their webs are more prone to damage. That's why these spiders have a fascinating habit. They often rebuild their entire webs every day, even if the current web seems perfectly fine. I wish I was this dedicated to maintaining my bedroom. These spiders actually do this because they want to be prepared for the evening when they patiently wait for their potential prey to get caught in their carefully set trap. At first, this might seem like a waste of time. After all, they need to invest a significant amount of protein to produce the silk that forms their webs. But even if an orb weaver spider doesn't catch its meal overnight, it usually has enough silk proteins to dismantle its old web and build a new one for the following night. As the spider removes the old web, it consumes the silk at the same time, and by doing that, recycles the proteins it contains. If you've ever observed a spider on its web, you must have noticed how attentively it responds to even the slightest vibrations. It turns out that spider silk can be finely adjusted to different sound frequencies, unlike any other material. When a spider builds its web, it doesn't just spin the silk and leave it as it is. The spider actually makes adjustments to the silk by changing how tight or loose it is and how different threads are connected. This way, it creates a web that can vibrate or make different kinds of sounds. The spider is like a musician tuning their guitar. This feather-legged lace weaver is called the garden center spider because it mostly enjoys humid greenhouse conditions. And it has a really cool way of catching insects. Instead of spinning sticky webs like other spiders, it uses electricity. It produces incredibly thin silk, almost at the nanoscale. And on its hind legs, this spider has special hairs that act like tiny combs. As the silk emerges from its body, the spider uses these hairs to comb and manipulate the silk. And here's where the magic happens. This process generates an electric charge. The threads of the silk are now crackling with electricity, so they come together to form little poofs that resemble fluffy balls of wool. These electrically charged poofs are a great way to trap innocent insects wandering around. When unsuspecting prey comes into contact with them, the electric charge causes the threads to cling to their bodies, making it almost impossible to get away. Female Darwin's bark spiders make gigantic webs that can stretch over rivers and lakes, which means they can reach over 80 feet across. It turns out such enormous webs are just a part of their genius plan to catch their prey. A super strong web that goes across the water like a bridge can capture large insects that gracefully fly above the water's surface, like dragonflies, and it's an impressive project that takes days to construct. These special lines go across the river and anchor the web firmly to each bank. There's no easy way out of this. Okay, I got it. Jeez. No need to swing your fists here. 
These savages can't even eat in mm. peace. When you think about it, spiders were one of nature's first true engineers. They make the toughest casters you can find on our planet. The silk spiders use to build webs is stronger than steel. They trap their prey in that web. They use it to dangle from the ceilings in our homes and haunt our dreams, too. Their silk is extremely stretchy. Considering how stretchy the silk is, plus the amount of force you need to use to break it, that combination shows the silk is so strong, it's able to take three times as much energy as Kevlar before it breaks. Now, Kevlar is a synthetic material used for tires and some other rubber products like cut-resistant gloves or flame and blast barriers. It's also a material used for sports gear. For example, it's the thing in your running shoes that helps you maximize your energy output. With Kevlar, boats are more tolerant of damage and lighter. It's extremely strong, five times stronger than steel and lightweight at the same time. Dragline silk is an especially strong kind of spider silk. A drag line connects the spider to its web. It's something like a safety line in case a spider falls and it needs to be strong enough to support the weight of the spider. A single strand consists of protein molecules, and they're aligned together really, really tightly. Each strand of spider silk is 1,000 times thinner than human hair. That's why you can break it so easily, even though it's really strong. But each strand is still stronger than many types of steel. You just have to get steel equally thin to truly compare it. Scientists believe that if we could make dragline silk, for instance, as thick as a pencil and 18.6 miles long, we would have material so strong we could stop a jetliner in the middle of a flight. But the passengers probably wouldn't like it. When it's windy outside and a wind or even just a light breeze catches the spider's sturdy dragline, it catches air and turns into some kind of an open parachute. That's when the adventure starts for a spider. Its dragline bends and stretches further. That way, it can send the spider to fly very far away and it won't break. And this way, spiders can really fly away hundreds of miles. Since spider silk is so strong, it inspired researchers to come up with new material. It's known as something called elastomer, since it's elastic like rubber. This material has a structure just like a spider web, and that's what makes it durable and allows you to evenly distribute the stress you put on it without breaking it. Just like spider silk, it's both exceptionally tough and stiff. Stiff materials can take a lot of stress before you manage to deform them, whereas tough materials can absorb a lot of energy before you break them. For instance, glass is stiff but not tough. When it comes to commercial materials, it's mostly a trade-off. With higher stiffness comes lower toughness, and vice versa. The fact this new spider silk-inspired material is high in both of these features makes it even cooler. There are more extremely hard materials we're discovering or even inventing. For example, there's a new type of glass that's harder than even diamonds. Diamonds are generally the hardest of all natural materials. But now, scientists have made a new type of carbon they named AM3. It's now the strongest and hardest amorphous material we know about. Amorphous means material doesn't really have apparent organization or shape. For example, rubber, glass, wax, and plastics. Diamonds are that strong and durable thanks to their extremely regular structure. You'd think this new material that's even stronger than that has a structure like a diamond too, but it's actually more similar to glass. You may have heard some people believe that glass is a liquid. It's not, but we really can't put it in the category of solid materials either. It's a peculiar amorphous material. So the molecules aren't as disorganized as in a liquid, but they're not in strict order as you'd see in a solid. AM3 conducts electricity well, but just in some cases. That means we could potentially use it to get, let's say, solar energy. This material would come in handy for bulletproof windows that are up to 100 times tougher than the technology we currently use. Mass production of this material will certainly be expensive. Plus, we'll have to wait for researchers to test it more. But this new yellow-tinted glass is definitely a material we might see a lot of sometime in the future.
The next one is wurtzite boron nitride. It's quite weird. It's harder than diamond, some studies say 18% harder, which is a lot, and it's amorphous at the same time. But the craziest part is that it's extremely rare because it forms only during volcanic eruptions. Then we have Lonsdale light. Let's say there's a meteor full of carbon that contains a bit of graphite too. It goes through the Earth's atmosphere and eventually collides with our planet. You probably think a meteor that's falling toward us is extremely hot. In reality, only its outer layers become hot. The interior of this object remains cool throughout most of its journey toward our planet. When this meteorite hits the surface of Earth, the pressure in its interior becomes insanely big. It's stronger than any other natural process that can affect the shape of graphite or some other material. Like, if you squeeze it or try to shape it with whichever technology you'd want, you'd still don't get a force that's as strong as the pressure that occurs during this impact. Because of this, the graphite in that meteor compresses and now has a crystalline structure. It's not like a diamond, even better. It turns out to be 58% harder. But for now, graphite that's harder than diamond is just a scientific theory. Scientists do study some real examples of graphite and its different shapes. But they have only those that are not that pure. That means there are lots of other elements in these materials that make this material softer than diamonds. But if there was a special pure graphite meteorite heading towards our planet and striking the surface, it would, without any doubt, create material way harder than any diamond we have ever found. And how about Dyneema? It's the strongest fiber in the world, 15 times stronger than steel. It's also nearly 40% stronger than aramid fibers. For example, Kevlar used for tires, the one we mentioned before. Dyneema is lighter than water, but is still great for things like ropes and towing lines for the shipping industry. It's a great material for nets for fishing and safety gloves in the metalworking field, too. Now here's something called palladium microalloy glass. As we said before, there are two very important features all materials have. The first one is strength. That's how much force some material can withstand before you manage to deform it. The second one is toughness. This stands for how much energy you need to fracture or break it. Ceramics are mostly strong, but not very tough. Elastic materials, such as rubber, can hold a lot of energy, but you can deform them relatively easy. And they're not strong. And over a decade, researchers created a new glass with a combination of five elements that ended up as a material that's stronger than all types of steel. Yup, this glass will rather deform than break. This is actually the hardest material that doesn't include carbon. And meet Bucky Paper. In the late 20th century, we discovered there's a specific form of carbon that, once again, is harder than diamonds. It's called carbon nanotubes. If we bind carbon into a different shape than diamond, we get a structure that's way more stable than any other we know about. And putting these carbon nanotubes together, you create Bucky Paper, which is basically an incredibly strong but also very, very thin sheet. It holds just 10% of the weight of steel, but at the same time, it's hundreds of times stronger. Daddy long legs get a pretty bad rap. Someone started a rumor for some reason that of all the spiders in the world, the daddy long legs are the most venomous. Of all the 45,000 species of spiders, daddy long legs were at the top of the charts as the most potentially dangerous. Gifted with the most threatening venom towards humans, they acquired quite the reputation. But unfortunately, their fangs also were too small to penetrate skin, so their amazing capabilities were deemed useless. Imagine having a superpower without the ability to use it. This fact might have come from someone's friend of a friend a long time ago, and unfortunately for old bouncy legs, the fact stuck. The daddy long leg spider is recognized throughout the world, but its actual name is Falsidae, which is part of the Araniomorph family. 
The Falsidae consists of up to 1,800 individual species, all ranging in different sizes and variations, most having the distinct similar long bouncy legs with a small body. They are present on every continent of the world, except Antarctica. But regardless of which part of the planet they're from, they all share that same supposed reputation of impressive venom, with no teeth to use it. The origin story of how their venom was recognized as so strong was that they were notorious all over the world for being able to remove other, more dangerous spiders. Any spider that was known to be threatening towards humans competed for territory with the daddy longlegs and lost. They defeated redbacks and black widows, even larger spiders like huntsmen. Every competitor was beaten. And for that reason, this ridiculous spider became the undisputed world champion. From the northern hemisphere to the south, from Australia to North America, in Africa, Asia, and all around Europe, the daddy longlegs took on all challengers, removing venomous spiders from households all over the world. As its reputation grew, it was portrayed that it must have the strongest venom, as no contender could match it. And there the legend rested. Actual facts were neglected, like cobwebs in the wind. But in fact, their venom is incredibly weak, so weak that it's not even very useful. It has little effect on the more venomous spiders, and is only useful towards smaller insect prey. But it does have a different, more impressive way of defeating all challengers in the spider world. Rather than bouncing over and trying to wrestle a foe awkwardly, the daddy longlegs casts its silk web onto its contenders from a distance, whilst keeping itself away from harm. Then, once it's safe, it ties them up until they're completely incapacitated. What's more, their own silk doesn't have any adhesive properties. So when they come for another spider, they usually roll it in its own sticky web. They're basically the cowboys of the spider world, coolly lassoing all dangers of the household, removing hazardous spiders and all other pesky insects. And for their selfless assistance, the only gratitude we've provided are urban legends about their supposed inadequacies and a quick removal with a vacuum cleaner. It's a shame to remove the daddy long legs from a house, as they are passive towards humans. They reside in dark and cool places where moisture is more prominent, like a bathroom or a basement. Since they're predators, they will only live where there is a constant source of food. So if you see them in your house, then that's a good indication that you have a lot more types of bugs living in other, more inconspicuous locations. Understanding that there are more bugs under your hard-to-reach places, removing the daddy long legs is effectively removing a bug remover, who not only works for free, but is a much more efficient hunter of bugs than your vacuum cleaner. They will not only remove the resident bugs, but all the hundreds of eggs that are hidden away, incubating, preparing to hatch in the near future. Perhaps the thought of them being a hunter may give you some apprehension of keeping them around, especially as you sleep. Further with the myth that a human inhales up to 10 spiders per year on average while sleeping. Since they don't mean humans any harm, there's no need to worry, especially given the difference in size. Predators generally won't attack anything they can't successfully take down, which won't be anything much larger than themselves. Given humans are over a million times bigger in size, we just aren't worth the risk for any spider, even if we're sleeping. The myth that we eat spiders in our sleep is false. There is nothing for a spider to hunt for around a human. A giant, meaty, growling mountain is the last place to find a spider trying to find its dinner. But if you do have a bad case of arachnophobia and are brave enough, simply get an empty jar and a piece of paper. Carefully place the daddy long legs in the jar and release it into the backyard. They're more than happy to live in the bark of trees or under rocks, protecting your garden from other insects. There are three types of daddy long legs, the spider variety, the crane fly one, and the apeliones, which are more related to scorpions than spiders. The apeliones have helped provide confusion with their spider counterpart, sharing similar features, residing in the same parts of the world, and even known for the same misinformation. In particular, for the urban legend of being the most venomous. Not only do these not have any venom glands, but they don't even have fangs, just grasping claws. 
Due to these physical traits, they are restricted to prey on small insects. Though their diet partially contains bugs, they are omnivorous, also feeding upon plant material and fungi. So, the Apeliones are mainly found outdoors, unless you happen to be growing mushrooms in your basement. Their primary defenses are to avoid detection, camouflaging themselves in foliage whilst holding very still, and sometimes placing debris on top of themselves. Some species will have bright coloring to ward off predators, and others will have a similar appearance to other insects to create confusion, all in the hopes of avoiding becoming a meal. As they aren't strictly an aggressor in the wild, they have a multitude of secondary defenses to avoid conflict. Using their long legs, they might retract or stretch them to resemble becoming inactive and pointless in being attacked. Also, they might bob up and down with the objective to confuse, constantly moving their small body. They do this individually, and as they can live in very large groups, they will collectively move this way when threatened. Their long legs, although strange in appearance, are one of their best assets. As well as dancing defensively, they can also flee very effectively, bounding over obstacles with ease. Normally, when in groups, they will all scatter in different directions. Their best defense is their scent glands, providing a smelly shield to ward off predators, letting them know they won't be a tasty meal. Although they can't physically defeat any spiders, the scent gland defense is known to help avoid some of the most brutal of spider predators, such as the wolf spider. Another effective way to deter predators is the form of mimicry, quietly pretending to be another insect, and likely trying to appear like its spider counterparts. This act of defense has probably helped the confusion between the daddy longleg species. The crane fly is the last of the three that represent daddy longlegs. It looks like a giant mosquito and lives in similar areas around marshes, rivers, and lakes. With the typical traits of its namesake, the long drooping legs, it's known as the worst flying insect. Its limbs are so large, it wobbles as it flies, looking like it's struggling to maintain its flight. The crane fly's larvae are also known as leather jackets due to their tough outer skin. They're very important in the soil ecosystem as they process organic material, increasing microbial activity. So why are they even called daddy long legs? There isn't anything scientific behind the meaning. There was a mention of the crane fly back in 1744, referring to it as father long legs. In the early 19th century, daddy long legs had become a nickname for a person that was much taller than everyone else. Whether the name was originally made for tall humans or for long-legged flies, as time went on, all other insects and spiders around the world that had the similar physical traits, long legs with a small body, would also be referred to as daddy long legs. I guess it was just easier that way. Ladies and gentlemen, gather round for the ultimate creepy crawly showdown. The moment we've all been waiting for, the main event in the arachnid division. In the blue corner, straight from the Sahara Desert, meet Mr. Scorpion. In the red corner, we've got a guest from South America, meet notorious Mr. Tarantula. In the wild, tarantulas and scorpions rarely cross paths, so let's take a look and see what happens if they both step into the ring. Grab your popcorn and soda because it's time for round one. Both scorpions and tarantulas have tough exoskeletons, but this is just a fancy word for a hard shell. Both shells are made of the same substance called chitin. It's a bit like the thing that makes up our nails. The scorpion's hard shell does give it a slight advantage, though. The tarantula strikes first using a dramatic defensive move called urticating hairs. It flings its barbed hairs at its opponent, which can irritate their skin, eyes, and even stop them from breathing. The scorpion better watch out. But wait! Tarantulas use this move on mammals they meet in their biomes, like mice. This impressive attack isn't affecting the scorpion because of its tough shell. That's one point to our stinging friend who takes an early lead. Round 2. Venom. Hey, I once had a girlfriend like that. The scorpion has powerful venom, and they inject their prey with it through their stinger, while tarantulas use their creepy fangs. Both of their venoms contain a whole cocktail of things designed to target the nervous system. Yow! As venoms are fast-acting, whoever is quick enough to get the first strike in the battle may get the upper hand. 
Because of an impressive thing called natural selection, scorpion venom is more effective against such animals like mice, lizards, and rats, but not tarantulas, since they're not a common threat to the scorpion. And yeah, both these guys have pretty similar venoms. You can try and sting Mr. Tarantula all you want, buddy, but looks like you're just going to be wasting your energy. Ow! Mr. Scorpion jumps up to Mr. Tarantula and stings it. Is that another point to this stinging guy? Hold on a second, take a look at the tarantula's leg. Looks like the scorpion's venom is already on there, but our spider friend is doing just fine. It may have evolved and grown an immunity to this venom. So it means that if stung, the spider is pretty much guaranteed to survive. However, there's a downside. It might make our eight-legged friend a little sleepy, but it wouldn't do any severe damage. Mr. Tarantula wins this round thanks to its immunity. Best get a blanket for our South American guest, just in case it gets snoozy. The score is tied 1 to 1. Round 3. Size Now, Size is another massively important factor. The bigger the animal is, the more venom is needed to take it down. The Goliath bird-eater tarantula in South America has an impressive body length of 8 inches and can weigh more than 17 ounces. Its leg can also span nearly 12 inches. For context, that's around the same size as an A4 page. Tarantulas are generally much bigger than scorpions. The biggest living scorpion, the giant forest scorpion, spans around 9 inches, including its legs and tail. In terms of a size advantage, the tarantula scores yet another point. 2 to 1 in favor of our 8-legged friend. Round 4. Special Effects One thing the scorpion has that the tarantula lacks is its sharp pincers. They're designed to catch prey so that they can be used against the tarantula. However, scorpions are rarely way larger than tarantulas, so those pincers can't bring much harm. Mr. Scorpion is making its next move. It's managed to grab one of the tarantula's hairy legs. While it seems like the scorpion might have the tarantula trapped and ready to attack, don't underestimate our spider friend. Tarantulas can amazingly afford to lose a leg or two and can detach their legs at the drop of a hat. They can drop their legs if they become trapped or grabbed by a predator. They can grow new ones later. The scorpion needs to act fast. Somebody quick, drop a hat! Mr. Scorpion lets go of the spider's leg and grabs another one before the tarantula can make its next move. Ah, too late. Our spider has managed to escape. The fangs on a tarantula are also far more potent than the scorpion's gnashers. The scorpion would need to spend a lot of time tearing at a tarantula to damage it enough to take it down. In that time, Mr. Tarantula has started to overpower Mr. Scorpion, and its fangs can do way more damage than the scorpion stinger. It's all starting to go downhill for Mr. Scorpion. Sorry, buddy. Its legs can be used for little other than walking, meaning that it's only got its tiny pincers and stinger for protection. And Mr. Tarantula has another ace up its sleeve. Well, it would if it had sleeves. What spiders may lack in pincers, they more than make up for with their metal tip fangs. Their fangs can easily punch through the scorpion's hard shell. Mr. Tarantula takes an early lead with yet another point, making it 3 to 1. Round 5. Speed! The Death Stalker scorpion can whip its tail at around 50 inches per second in a defensive strike. That covers a distance the size of 4 human feet every second. This is super impressive, but the Texas brown tarantula can also move at similar speeds. So, while the scorpion can strike fast, the tarantula can avoid its attack just as easily. It looks like both get a point where speed is concerned. The score is now 4-2. to two. two rounds are still ahead, and there's a chance for Mr. Scorpion to end up in a draw. Round 6. Hunting Skills Mr. Tarantula is unnatural when it comes to hunting, tracking down small lizards, mice, and rats. They also eat other spiders. What won't these furry guys do? Um, juggling? Come on, eight arms! Unlike tarantulas, scorpions are no hunters. Instead, they wait for their food to come to them. They also only eat small insects and bugs and cannot take down larger mammals, which is not the case with tarantulas. But scorpions do have a slight advantage here. Because they survive by waiting for other animals, they have the superpower to detect vibrations in the ground. So if a tarantula was approaching, the scorpion could detect it before the spider has time to make its attack. Both talents are outstanding, so it's another draw in this round as things are really starting to heat up. The score now stands at 5-3. to three. Round 7. Hidden Talent 
The tarantula has one more big advantage. It squirts a damaging substance onto its food to feast on it without cutlery. These juices then turn their meals into a sort of a smoothie, which they then slurp up without even having to chew. Oy. Oh wait, I meant wow! With such a talent, it could win a cooking contest. But scorpions have hidden talents too. While Mr. Scorpion may be losing the fight on land, if it can get the tarantula into water, the eight-legged creepy crawly doesn't stand a chance. Scorpions have impressive lungs called book lungs. And no, this doesn't mean they're great readers. It means that when they're submerged underwater, they can survive for up to 48 hours. The spider could last nowhere near that amount of time underwater without scuba gear. The score's at the end of the hidden talent round at 5-4. The referee stops the contest. On that note, it's all over for Mr. Scorpion. Our spider friend takes the champion belt. The tarantula's friends and family are celebrating the victory. The spiders all over the world are celebrating today's win, too. They've seen the fight on TV. Don't ask. In areas with big tarantula populations, there's not a single scorpion to be found. It looks like the tarantulas are hunting down the scorpions and making them run away. And this isn't even the first time tarantula and the scorpion have faced off. The Mexican red rump tarantula versus the bark scorpion is another showdown for the history books. The tarantula wins every single time. It doesn't even matter who has the first hit. Probably next time, it's best to have another tournament underwater. Back in 2009, people in Ishikawa, Japan, saw a kind
cherry and as large as a watermelon. During the night, you can see dozens and sometimes even thousands of fireballs. Scientists don't have any solid explanation why it happens, but it's probably flammable gas released by the marshy environment. Still, a local superstition claims it's all because of a giant serpent living in the Mekong. Tornadic water spout is a tornado that doesn't occur on land, but on water. The speed of the tornado can be really high. The water is collected and partially pulled up. It manages to pull fish and even turtles up into the air. Actually, raining fish can also be explained by this weather phenomenon. The same might happen on the snow, too, but it's really rare. There are only six pictures of snow spouts, four of which were taken in Ontario. This weather phenomenon requires that the water is warm enough to produce fog while the air temperature is really cold, next to impossible. Lava is red, sky is blue, I'm on bright side, and so are you. Okay, I made that up. But the part about the lava being red can change. That's true, especially if you see the lava flowing from Kauai Jen volcano located in Indonesia. It has a typical red color during the day, but at night, it turns luminescent blue. No mystery behind it, just tons of sulfuric acid. This volcano also has the largest acidic crater lake in the world. The water there is so turquoise, you want to jump in immediately. But you probably already guessed that you should never ever do that. The fire on that volcano is also blue, and it's the largest blue fire in the world rising up to 16 feet. In some places, water may look like glass. White salt ponds might look like windows or even portals to the world underneath. They have their look because of salt evaporation, and such lakes can be found in France and India. But the Cargill salt ponds in the San Francisco Bay Area look even crazier because of vibrant colors. The shades vary. It can be deep blue, grass green, orange, crimson, vermilion, and even magenta. The color difference is all about the different levels of salinity and tiny microorganisms living in those ponds. On the shore of the Baltic Sea in Kaliningrad District, Russia, there's an enigmatic national park called Dancing Forest. The pine trees are all crooked and twisted there. The forest didn't appear until the early 60s, when the pines were planted to make the dune sand in that area a bit more stable. It's probably the unstable sand that made those trees twist that way. Another reason why those trees are so crooked might be strong winds. Some people claim it has something to do with supernatural powers. They say this forest is a place where positive and negative energies meet. Locals believe if someone climbs through one of the rings in those trees, it'll add an extra year to this person's life. The throbbing hum in Taos, New Mexico has driven locals crazy since the 1990s. Low-frequency hum doesn't let you sleep normally. Even though scientists tried so hard to find the source of the hum, they failed. They blamed it on mechanical devices and even animals. The West Seattle hum, for example, was related to toadfish. Different variations of hum were also heard in the UK, Australia, and in some areas of the United States. Luckily, only about 2% of the world's population can hear it. Not to lessen clouds, or simply night clouds, are so rare because 1. They only form in summer, and 2. They can only be seen at latitudes between 50 and 70 degrees both north and south. To see those clouds, the sun should be already below the horizon, but the clouds still have to be in sunlight. It's possible for the highest clouds in the atmosphere, which are located about 50 miles up. We can't see them during the day because they're too faint. Fairy rings, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are the enigmatic rings of mushrooms that appear in grasslands and forested areas. Scientists can't explain why these fungi can form nearly perfect circles. But the superstition claims that fairy dances would burn the ground, causing mushrooms rapid growth. In fact, it's partially true. The mushrooms grow in places where a grass withered. The Amazon River, one of the longest on our planet, stretches for 4,000 miles which is more than a drive from Vienna to New Delhi. But there's one river in South America that beats the Amazon River twice. First, it's wider. Second, nobody ever saw it. It's an Amazon underwater twin called the Hamza River, and it runs 2.5 miles underneath. Scientists found it 10 years ago, back in 2011. Don't blink, or you'll miss this rarest weather phenomenon. Red sprites are electrical discharges in the sky that look a bit like an aurora. It's super powerful, about 10 times stronger than any regular lightning, but it lasts just a couple of seconds. They were first photographed in 1989, and there are still very few photos and video recordings of this lightning. 
to make a video that can clearly show red sprites. It should be at about 7,000 frames per second. Well, I'm out.